everyone, it's Marisol Medina from Microblading Hub here, and today I have a great interview for you all. If you've ever heard of Browse by G, the woman behind the brand is Giovanna Menena, and she's coming here today to tell us about how she went from a $75 chair in her condo to building a $1 million company with two locations out in Winnipeg and uh, about 25 employees working under her wing. Giovanna has written down for us the 10 steps for microblading business success. If you enjoy this interview, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. It really helps us out. If you love this type of content, then go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I am always really happy to produce this kind of content for you because I know it really helps you out when you're just getting started. Also, this interview is an exclusive event with my Innovate and Create group coaching ladies. I do group coaching for entrepreneurs getting started in the PMU industry. And uh, if you're interested in that, just uh, hit down below. I'll leave a few links. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Marisol Medina Coach and over on Facebook. I'll leave all the links below. Let's connect, say hi, leave a comment below. Just interact. Let's check it out. All right, hello everybody and welcome to today's very, very special phone call. So I am very thrilled to invite and to host uh, Giovanna Manena. She is the founder of Browse by G. Hi, <laughs> hello, hello. I've been following you for quite a while, and so I'm, I was super thrilled when you accepted our invitation to come speak to us. Uh, this is an exclusive event for Innovate and Create Ladies. Innovate and Create is a micro-coaching program for women in the PMU industry uh, who want to grow their businesses and be very successful and work smarter and not harder. I'm just going to give you the floor and let you introduce yourself and tell us about the great topic that you have for us in store today. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, first and foremost. It's such a pleasure to be a part of this community. Um, and it's really been a passion of, of mine to also help and empower people who are newer to the industry or looking to improve, improve their skill sets as well. Um, so basically, my history is I was born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And um, I started off in university and took business courses. And after about two years of being in university, really found that the learning style there wasn't conducive to my learning style. And it's, you know, I've now realized I'm not alone in it. A lot of people find that university isn't the type of learning style for them. So after about two years and going through a bit of a depression, I decided to change my life and switch gears altogether and choose something that really I was passionate about. And at the time it was makeup. And so I went to Toronto, I learned um, everything from beauty to television to prosthetic makeup, loved it. I worked in the industry for about three and a half, four years. And after a while, I had that itch again that I needed something more, I needed something different. So I ended up moving back to Winnipeg and going back to business school because that for me was, I guess, the only thing to do is to go back and learn more. Mm -hmm. And so during that time, I didn't want to go back to the restaurant industry or bartending or anything like that. So I really decided I wanted to use my skill set. And at the time, um, my first instinct was like, well, I'm really good at brows. I specialized in it while I was in Toronto and I did makeup. So I started my first in-home studio um, out of my condo. <laughs> I purchased like a, a broken barber chair. <laughs> it was literally broken and it was $75 and I refurbished it, put a little love into it and um, started taking shaping and tinting clients out of there. And then I had people coming to me and asking, you know, what can you do for me? I have no eyebrows. And at that time I was like, well, what am I supposed to do for you? You have no eyebrows. And so I wanted to offer them a service. I wanted to be able to help them. And the first thing that popped into my I guess line that I was going down was actually eyebrow extensions. Have you ever heard of that before? Yes. Okay. I, have my own very, uh, I guess I have my own opinion about them. I yeah. Guess. So I'm just going to say it. They suck. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I like took so much, um, 
I like put so much faith into them because I was like, this is the next best thing. I'm going to like love what I, what I'm doing. And with the eyebrow extensions and I invested like $1,500 into it, which is like all the money I had at the time yeah. and they failed. And I had clients calling me and complaining and wanting to come back and get them refilled like the next day or the day after. And it just wasn't sustainable. So I was like, there has to be something better. There absolutely has to be something better. So I started calling around and trying to get more information. And it was at the time almost like, no one knew what microblading was. No one had any idea what permanent cosmetics really was or the education behind it. What and year so, was this, more or less? Sorry? What year was this, more or less? Uh, this was probably, I'm going to say, about six and a half, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was, it's really grown since then and tremendously. Okay. And so, yeah, and basically... Um, I kind of said like in my own head, I'm like, there has to be something better. What if you just put like little tiny tattoos that look like hair strokes and like it kind of popped in my mind and I was like, well, I don't know if that's a thing. So I started like calling around to see if I could get like permanent cosmetics and maybe make my own like thing up. And then all of a sudden, you invented it basically. Yeah, no, and I, <laughs> it was already invented, but I was just like, Oh, what if, right? And so I ended up calling around and there was somebody in Toronto who was like, Oh, have you heard of microblading? And I was like, Nope, don't know what that is. And so she's like, well, don't waste your money on finding eyebrow extension courses because that's a waste of money. This is the next best thing. And I was like, okay, like I've already spent, you know, $1,500 of the only money I have. And now I'm going to go spend another, you know, $3,000 to learn this. So I basically was like, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And went out, learned the skill set and uh, came back and did not have the education that I should have had. It just wasn't, um, it didn't cover like health and safety or what I needed or anything like that so coming back was a huge learning curve for me like what I needed to have in terms of health and safety and everything and that's a whole rabbit hole that we can get down but basically I just started small and I was the first one to bring it to Winnipeg and I really built my business off of word of mouth and from starting in my in-house studio I bootstrapped everything that I did. I reinvested in myself and I was able to now, I now have 25 employees, two locations. I train across Canada and I've now built over a million dollar company. So it's crazy where you can take yourself if you just apply yourself. So I'm going to take you through the 10 steps to really thinking about your PMU business as a whole and giving you some tips and tricks as to really what worked for me in my company and hopefully that you can take some things home and apply them to your own lives and into your own businesses. So let's get started. So step one is get clear on your vision. Now, what does that mean? So your vision is what you want for yourself, what you want for your company, what you want for your clients. So a few questions I like to ponder or ask when I ask people, what is your vision for your business is, you know, usually a few things. The first one is, do you want to work for yourself? And have you weighed the pros and cons of working for yourself, first and foremost, of everything that goes into it? Um, if you do want to work for yourself and you have the right intentions behind it, then how do you want your customers to feel? when they walk in the door, what's their experience like? What do you want them to see when they walk in? Like, I really want you to think about every little detail of that customer experience, because that is really what's gonna set you apart from your competition. Where do you wanna perform your services? Do you want them to feel comfortable when you perform your services? Why did you wanna become a PMU artist? Like, what is your story? Because this is gonna really add in to creating your marketing plan later on. Um, why did you wanna become a PMU artist in the beginning? Why should they book with you? This, this part right here, why they should book with you, this is called your value proposition. This is what's gonna make you different and if you can identify exactly why they should book with you, then you're gonna have a really easy time when it comes to market yourself and selling yourself. So that's really important. So now in terms of getting clear on your vision, this is just about writing it down. So you can either take some time and journal it out. You can 
open up a voice note on your phone and just start brainstorming. You can write down on a whiteboard, whatever works for you. I highly recommend just getting your thoughts from your brain to paper because getting them out is really what's gonna move them forward. Um, so let's move on to step two. Once you have your vision, it's really important to now take that vision and put it into a plan. And the plan is something like a business plan, a marketing strategy, or like I said, just writing your vision down on paper and basically getting it out in physical form. So if you at a certain point Point ever do require you know an investor or funding from your bank you're gonna have to be able to produce a business plan and business plans are really good for not only that but also these other two functions which are if you have a team later on and you want to align yourself and your team with those values or that mission or that vision having a business plan makes it really clear so that everyone's on the same page um, it also helps you if you want to set measurable goals. So if you want to track your progress against like what you did last month or the last six months or the last year, um, and then you can hold yourself and others accountable to those measurable goals. So the last one was those, that third party investor or a bank. So a business plan will really secure you because this can support basically any objective you want to do. It just gives you a clear vision as to where you wanna go with your company and it puts it all down so that everyone's on the same page. Um, basically a well-run business requires setting up a specific objective, assigning responsibility, timelines, and really measuring your results. So it's actually crazy how many businesses can succeed without a business plan. But I think it's really risky if you don't have one, because sometimes when you take shortcuts and let's say later on down the road, you don't want to own your business anymore, you want to move on to something else, then you need to have these things in place and show what you've been able to accomplish. And checking in with that business plan is a really great way to do that. Uh, I just unmuted myself because I wanted to ask you uh, yeah. what be on people's minds right now. Uh, yeah. So how does one uh, how does one go about making a business plan? Like, if if one has never tried to do this, is this something that you actually did? Like, did you Google how to do how to make a business plan? Absolutely. So, like, developing a well and concise business plan, it can be a very powerful tool. And how I actually did it was um, basically you can go on Google and look up templates. But sometimes if you don't understand what certain areas are asking you or you don't understand how to do, let's say a competitive analysis or a SWOT analysis, it can take some time to truly understand like the depths of the business plan. So there's a, there's a, you know, three great options that you have if you're just figuring out how to do this. The first one is to find a mentor. So somebody who is either really good at writing a business plan, has run a business before, can, offer you some guidance on how to write it out or make it really clear for yourself. Templates, one I really love to use is off of Futurepreneur. Uh, it's Futurepreneur Canada, so I'm not sure, for those of you who might be in the States, I'm sure that that template will be a good um, baseline for you, but make sure that you also include other things that maybe are required in the US as well. Um, go ahead. Like a printer, uh, an entrepreneur in the future, future printer? Future printer, yeah. F U T U R P R E N U E R. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another great website would be SCORE, uh, S C O R E. It, all, it has some great financial tem templates, so definitely check that out. Um, and then the third option is you can hire somebody to help you. That is like a really easy way. Um, you know your business better than anyone else, but they can actually help take those ideas and all of your knowledge and apply it to a business plan. It can get a bit costly, but you want to make sure that if you want to be successful and you want to secure funding, that you have somebody who's really strong in that area to help you develop that. Secure funding. That seems like, whoa, like next level stuff. Like mm -hmm. um, you have investors. Have you gone out and done that already? Yeah, so my business was featured on Dragon's Den, which is almost like Shark Tank in the US. Mm -hmm. So like securing funding could be anything from like if you need to secure funding to open up your first shop 
or you need money to buy supplies or take out a line of credit for larger orders, or you want to like start your own product line, whatever that may be for, you know, the individual who's looking into it, securing funding can be anything from like $5,000 to like $100,000 and upwards of that. So anything that you do, banks, angel investors, um, any institution, even like if you're in Canada, Futurepreneur is a great resource for funding, especially if a bank won't give it to you. Um, they just need to see and understand where that money is going to. And they, they, it's like almost like a risk profile for them to see, okay, can I invest in this person? Is this going to be a good investment for me? And so that business plan shows that you're organized and that you know what you want to put that money towards. Number three is take action on your plan. So this is where you put all of your planning to work. So what I really like to do, especially after I get all my thoughts down, is I put myself in the position of my customer and I like to focus on the customer. Um, basically, from their perspective, what do you think would really wow them or really have them coming back to you or talking to their friends and and you know, promoting you with word of mouth. And that's really, really easy advertising. Um, you wanna validate your assumptions with your customers. So were your assumptions with who or wants or needs PMU correct? So in your plan, when you created your demographic person, like my ideal clientele is anywhere from 18 to 30 and she's the, you know, trendy woman or this and that, or is it like the 50 to, you know, 65 year old who needs PMU, who can't, you know, no longer can see in the mirror, like who is your ideal clientele? And then you wanna go out and validate that by seeing what types of customers are coming in. Um, you know, who is really attracted to what you're doing? What types of customers do you get coming in your door? So that's a really great way to validate. And then you want to see if your marketing plan, like, cause you're gonna add a little bit of that into your business plan, hopefully. Is it working? Like, have you decided where you wanna market? Is it Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, word of mouth, influencer, radio? There's so many different platforms that you can advertise on. Which ones are you testing? Which one's working for you? And how do you adjust if it's not? And are you on the right platforms? Like, are you researching where most people are in your demographic? Are you understanding what they want or what they want to see? Maybe it's before and after photos. Maybe it's an educational component. So it's really important to go out there and test that market. Um, the other thing is you want to impress your customers and create an amazing experience for them. So creating a seamless customer experience from start to finish, from like, the time when they book online or in person with you to when they leave and check out, how are you making that whole experience completely seamless for your customer so that they were just like, oh, wow, that was so easy. That was so fantastic. I can't wait to tell all my friends about it. So keep that in mind because if you focus on the customer, I promise you, you will get more customers. Um, you wanna ensure that your customer is receiving value for what they just paid for. Do you value yourself as an individual, as, as an artist, or are you trying to just like cut to the lowest price and maybe you're just getting that kind of clientele? So you really have to try to find where you fit in the market and then, you know, go from there and start making changes or figure out what's really working for you. Uh, and then the last thing is the follow up with the customers. Are you checking in with them, you know, a day later, a week later, a month later? Are they happy? What do they, you know, what could you do to help alleviate any questions that they have along the process? Or maybe they leave and you told them 10 times that their brows were going to be extremely dark upon leaving, but they're still freaking out the next day. Maybe giving them like a nice little phone call to just be like, hey, I'm here with you. Remember I told you yesterday that your brows were going to be really dark? Yeah, I'm just checking in on you to make sure that you're still okay with them, right? Like little things that'll help your customers just be like, oh, she was thinking of me. Yeah, she did say that. And oh, maybe I shouldn't overreact. So how do you anticipate their needs? before they actually like have a freak out or um, you know, come to you with a thousand questions and waste your time in that regard. So it's really important to like anticipate, you know, put it out there and then it'll make it so much easier in the long term for you. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> now step four is implementing process. So for those of you just starting out or maybe building your businesses, 
you know, you have to think about your booking services. Are you making it really easy for people to book with you? Um, are your consent forms seamless? Have you had a lawyer look over them? Um, have you given the information to your clients prior to them coming in for their service? That's really important because sometimes people come in and they're like, oh, I didn't know if I had this that I can't get this service done. Well, if you send them all the information prior to, that's really going to alleviate any unknowns or like, oh, I just booked off two hours for this client and now I can't do it. So make sure to check that and make sure they have all the information prior to coming in. Um, what I did with myself and my, um, my employees is I actually created like scripts for them to help them along the way. So if you need to create a script for yourself, I highly recommend that because that's going to help you to ensure that you get all the information in for your clients, that everything is there and you've said it and you can rest assured that you've gone through your script and that everything is covered with your client. Um, what I did in the beginning is I actually had my clients sign off on each step of the process. So the mapping process, I had them sign off on the consent form, I had them sign off on the color, because I just wanted to ensure that the client and I were both on the same page when it came to doing any service whatsoever, because they couldn't come back the next day or the week and saying like, oh, I didn't agree to that. So it's a really great way if you have people who are questioning you know, what you're doing, how you're doing it, that they sign off on each step of the process just to alleviate any um, like backtracking or you didn't tell me this or I didn't like approve of this. And that really helps to alleviate that. And then, like I said, I really like to do the follow-up check-ins. It really helps my clients feel like I'm there for them, with them through the whole process. So I get to check in with them a day after, a week after, and a month after. Step five is consistency. So the more consistent you are, the more clients are gonna recommend and become comfortable in seeing you. So I always have this saying that if you're persistent, you'll get it, but if you're consistent, you'll keep it. So it's important with your services that you stick to what you're doing and make sure it's the same service for every single client because the second you start to switch up things from client to client and make it like a little different or maybe what you charge one person this price and another person that price, oh my gosh, it just becomes a complete disaster because people will be like, well, my friend said this and then you're trying to remember what you have said to one client and not to the other. So sometimes it's hard, but put your foot down and be consistent. Um, step six is my favorite. It's to fail. And failing has been the most rewarding thing in my uh, journey through this whole process because if I didn't fail, I wouldn't have gotten better. So you have to figure out what works and what doesn't and what's working for you in your business and what isn't. So you have to adjust what's not working immediately. Like the next day you have to make those changes because you, know, you don't want that um, thing that's not working to go on any further. You want to also, when I first started, I started making a list of the common complaints that people were having, and I really reflected on them because I wanted to be better. Um, and I also made a list of what was going right so I could put more energy into that. The one thing I wanted to say, though, about failing and your clients is you really need to let go of the ego. And what I mean by that is sometimes when clients come to you and they complain about something or they're unhappy with something, we immediately take it so personally and we want to like, you know, tell them, well, we're the, we're the specialist at this. We do this every single day. But the most important thing is to listen to your customer because your job as a micropigmentation specialist or PMU specialist is to try to somewhat be a mind reader as to what your clients want for their face, for their bodies. So it's really important to be very sensitive to that. And sometimes as artists and as creatives, like we take that very personally because it's our work, but it's really important that you know to just try to let go of that ego because the ego will hold you back from getting better. Because sometimes you might think you know what's best, but if you just listen to your client and make those little tweaks and changes, they're gonna be so happy and you might learn something new about your technique or about the way that you're doing business that you didn't know before and you can continue to implement that and understand other clients better as well. 
So doing that will honestly make your business flourish so quickly because everyone's so quick to be like, no, I'm right. So if you can just like let that ego die for a second and just listen to your client, my goodness, everything will change for you, I promise. <laughs> Step seven is invest in yourself. Now this can mean new equipment, a better space, better tools or products, continuing your education because everything changes so quickly. Um, you wanna stay on top of trends, educate yourself, learn different platforms if you can. Um, you know, it's important as you're starting to, when you're investing in yourself, like you don't have to spend a lot of money, but paying for certain advertising or collaborations can be really, um, can really have a big return on investment. And sometimes it also means doing free services because you're investing in yourself to have that person go out and talk about you. Um, you also have to find people who have the skill sets that you need. One big thing when I first started my business was I thought I had to do absolutely everything myself. And I promise you, this is just a surefire way for you to have complete and utter burnout because basically you're trying to do social media, your website, marketing, dealing with clients, booking people in. You have a thousand different jobs going on all at once. But if you can get to a point where you can start to hire people who have the skill sets, who can kill for you, that is exactly what you need to invest in. So for instance, like marketing, it's really important if you don't know how to use Instagram properly or plan your posts or put out good content, hire somebody to teach you how to do that or if you don't want to do that, you can just get somebody to like post it for you, right? Um, if you're not good at writing and you need blog posts to go out about educational content, get somebody to write a blog post. Accounting, if you're not good at numbers, it's me, um, get somebody to do your accounting for you because you're going to sit there for 10 hours, waste your time when you can just take another client and make more money, right? So you got to balance the you know, being smart with it and also investing in yourself at the same time. Um, the next one is you want to also differentiate yourself and build yourself a brand when you're building your team. So it's important you can get inspiration from other brands, but to build your own brand, you have to figure out who you are as an individual and play that into what your company is and what you want it to be. So for example, my business, was built off of a few different things. I would say it was built off integrity. It was built off of empowerment and quality. Like those are the things I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't compromise whatsoever. Like I don't care if Susie down the street is microblading for a hundred dollars. I would not raise, I would not lower my prices. I'm not in that ball game. And I knew who I was. I was a quality provider. I was a luxury brand. I knew that I, gave a lot of time and dedication to my clients. And eventually, you know, you might have a few clients that you lose to that specific person, but that means that they weren't your clients to start off with. So the more you want to stay focused and attract the clients that you need, those are the ones that are gonna start showing up at your door because they value you as a person. So when you put your own values and build that into your own company, that's what's gonna start showing up for you. So something I really like to do is I like to create a value, I do like a value exercise. Like what are my three core values that I wanna build into my business? So it can be like family, it could be, you know, art, it could be, I don't know, relationships, whatever your values are, and you wanna build that in, that's what's really gonna show up. And those people who have the same values are gonna now find you because you're attracting that type of clientele. Step nine. <laughs> Collaboration over competition. This one is so hard because sometimes this can be a really cutthroat industry because everyone wants to be an artist. Everyone wants to, you know, build their business and, you know, get in on the action because they see the potential that you can make as a PMU specialist. Now, not everyone survives in this industry. I would say that, you know, the people who really dedicate themselves to it really rise to the top. So the thing is along the way, stay classy because there's always gonna be people who try to cut you down and you know, tear apart your brand or speak badly about you, but you're not gonna do that because <laughs> you're better than that. So competition is always gonna be there. You should know that, but 
I truly have understood that it makes you hungry and it makes you want to be better. It pushes you to do more. So I figured out a way to leverage my competition rather than let it either beat me down. And sometimes it might happen to you that you might want to collaborate with your competition because that's a really great way to bring in more clientele when you push things out together. So that community aspect is really, really important. So if there's somebody you can collaborate with who's also a kick-ass babe, then make sure to do that. Now, number 10, the most important one I would say, go out and get it. Guys, no one is gonna make this happen but you. If anything fails in your business, it is on you. You have to take extreme ownership of everything that you're doing in your business. If something's not working, change it. Everything you can figure out, I promise you, but you have to really want it and you have to wanna to put the work in because a lot of people think it's gonna come so easily and it takes so much dedication and so much work. Sleepless nights, you know, worrying about your clients, worrying about all these things. But at the end of the day, if you really want this, it is so worth it because you are helping people feel confident about themselves. You are changing their lives with their appearances. You are making them feel empowered and confident when they leave and you've now given them a service that they don't have to worry about anymore. They can just wake up and go. So these are all really great things, but you really have to go and get it yourself because no one's going to hand it to you on a silver platter. And I wish that somebody could do that because that would be the secret sauce to it all. But honestly, it's the best thing. And it's so rewarding when you do it yourself and you just, you know, put your heart and soul into it and, and make it yours. So thanks for listening to my 10 steps. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Thanks. I, like, I, just know. <laughs> I love it. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So um, with that, let's open up the floor uh, for any questions. Uh, Giovanna was adamant that we let uh, a good amount of this hour for questions. We just want to be really, really thorough and make sure you guys get in on all of your doubts and all of your, your questions. Um, while you guys think about that, I just wanna bring up uh, a few key points that I thought were really interesting. Um, the, first, the first thing that Giovanna actually tried for first enterprise, uh, so to speak, was turn, turned out to be a failure. So- Huge failure, huge. <laughs> the the, the uh, brow extension things, the- um, it, it just, it failed, right? And then so that is incredibly important as that was one of her numbers. I, I think my numbers got all messed up, but I, I, I have that as number seven. Um, mm -hmm. Failing being the most rewarding thing for you and your, and your business and it teaching you what you, um, I guess, forcing you to innovate, you know? And that's why this group is called Innovate and Create because once you, you fail, you have to innovate. And also that I thought, something else I thought was, um, was pretty interesting was this this what you mentioned about staying classy you know it's it's so difficult sometimes to like just not give in to temptation and think okay well maybe it's just the market and I have to lower my prices um, maybe I'm just too expensive so that's also I think really valuable of um, just standing your ground and always just keeping your north, your north very clear. Um, let's do a round of presentations because these guys, these ladies are super quiet. So I know that, let's let's open up the mic for Hetty. Hetty, you there? Hetty is down in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And she's watching, she's gonna open up her mic and introduce herself and ask you maybe something, maybe a question that she didn't get to ask or anyone else is uh welcome to open up their microphones danielle Z if you're too shy you can just like chat box me and i can answer it <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly you know, guys take advantage of this it's uh valuable information here i have a question hey hi Zima. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me okay yeah, i can hear you okay um i have a question um about like prices i'm currently in the um in the middle of possibly increasing my prices mm -hmm. and I know a lot of people say before you do that um, you know you want to definitely make an announcement mm -hmm. and give people a warning or like not a warning but a heads up yeah that you're going to do that 
Um, I'm just wondering, like, what's the best way to do that? Like, is it social media? Is it live video? Like, what's the best way to communicate that to your audience? That's a great question. Um, is this price that you want to raise to going to be like your price for a long time? Or are you wanting to like slowly incrementally raise your prices the next I, year? Yeah, I would like to slowly um, raise my prices over the next year. Okay. So what I would recommend in this case would to be to do something called a um, like a ladder or a scale. So what that might look like is creating like, um, like you don't have to create a uh, visual for your clients. But what you can say is, you know, uh, January 2020, um, my prices will be going up. Thank you to all my clients who've supported me up until this point. Um, it, starting January 1st, 2020, the first 10 clients that book with me will be at X price um, until those spots are gone. After that time, my prices will be going up again. Or, you know, so you keep creating like this limited booking space or how many spaces you want for that price point before you're like, okay, I'm getting really good. Now I want to go and raise my prices again so that you right. can take yourself from here to here, but do it in like increments in the ladder so that your clients know that, oh, she's continuously going to be raising her prices. I need to get in sooner. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> Let me just piggyback off of that really great answer. So when an artist is starting out, uh, how soon is too soon to get to the end point? Uh, I know that I feel uh, that a lot of people start this out and um, they've just learned the technique and maybe they've done 10 people and then they want to charge, uh, you know, full prices. So mm -hmm. what do you recommend when it comes to that? How soon is too soon? Well, with my artists and, you know, even with myself, like I wanted to master the technique and make sure I understood every aspect of like how people were coming back healed, that I could troubleshoot those healed results. So it took me probably about a year before I felt really confident charging like, I don't know where everyone else is, what the high range is, but for Winnipeg, I would say like the 500 to $600 is the high range, whereas 300 to 350 is the low range. Um, I know in places like Toronto and Vancouver, they can charge $750 to $1,000 for certain services. So it's all depending on what area you're in. But if you want to get to your high end, you should be like a master at what you're doing, which means like you feel confident if somebody comes in with an issue or they heal weird or you need to know how to troubleshoot or correct. You have to know how to deal with that because if you're at a loss and you can't answer that, then you're not at a point where you're you're able to charge that amount of money. Like people want to feel confident coming to you and whatever happens to them, you have to be able to like give them guidance on the, the necessary steps that need to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody have another question? So we'll just open up the floor. Okay. So if there are no questions, I'll ask a bunch of questions because I have like a, a gazillion. Um, <laughs> so Jumana, tell us about when, you know, when you were just a, a solopreneur and you were a one woman operation, um, how you went from, and now, yeah, because now we can delve a bit into your story, you know, since we didn't really get a chance to do that. Um, oh, somebody's asking a question in the chat. So I'll, I'll ask mine and then read the one in the chat. Uh, so, yeah, talk to us about when you were a one-woman show and to when you were making that jump to getting your first space. So mm -hmm. you were at your business in that moment, and how did you know that it was a necessary step to take? Yeah, that's a great question. So every step that I took in my business to go to the next step, I ensured that my schedule was fully booked, that I had a bit of a wait list going, that, you know, I had the clientele there to support myself to make those moves. Because if I wasn't fully booked, I wasn't able to support myself or reinvest in my business, then I wouldn't have been ready to take that next step in business. So with whatever you're doing, I always say take baby steps, because if you don't take baby steps and you try to do like a major jump, you're like, oh, I just got my certificate. Oh, I have to like open up my first shop and do this. Well, you're not really validating the market. You're not seeing if people know you or getting comfortable or becoming an authority in the space. So it's really important to establish yourself, build a client list, 
and then start to move up slowly. And the slower and the more, um, I guess, Aggressive. calculated that you do it, the better it'll be long term. Okay. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> can I, can I, Marisol, can I piggyback off that question? Go ahead. So I'm kind of in a spot right now where I'm, um, I work full time, um, so a full time job career, and I'm getting into the PMU industry. And so I just started a couple months ago. Um, and it's been difficult, but I'm starting to see some results um, through the advertising that I've been doing with Marisol's help. Um, so it's good and I'm getting excited about it. But I also don't want to get too excited about it and just start to think that, you know, I can leave my job mm -hmm. and go into, you know, PMU full time. Mm -hmm. And me and Marisol have had this conversation before. And there's day, it's a roller coaster right now because there's good days and there's bad days, like you said. Mm -hmm. So I feel confident some days and I don't feel so, like confident. Like when would you think would be the right time for someone like me to leave their career? Mm -hmm. I know it's a hard question for you to answer, but. No, that's uh, a great question because I was also in school and I had to decide whether or not to finish my last year or start my business. So you have to like, let me know like where you're at in terms of your client list. Like, are you having clients who you have to turn away because you don't have the time or that available time for them to take them? Or are you still trying to get more clients? Uh, definitely still trying to get more clients. Um, I, I, I see about on average, like two to three clients a week, but those could include touch-ups as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not completely, I don't feel like I'm in the position where I'm booked, you know, for my, and I am only available on Saturdays and Sundays. So mm -hmm. I have limited time too. So that could be the reason why I have to turn some people away and say, well, my next available appointment is mid-December at this mm -hmm. point. And, but, um, so I don't know if I can even like really say that, you know, I'm, I'm at that stage, but, um, I definitely feel like if I opened up my time more, I could definitely get more clients because I'm limiting myself. Is there any days during the week, like Monday to Friday in the evenings that you could open up? Unfortunately, no. Cause I work in a different city. Like my full, like okay. my business is in a different city than my full-time career gotcha. job. That makes it yeah. a little bit difficult. Um, that. Yeah, that, that's a difficult thing because if there, if this is really where you want to take your yourself like full time, then I would start to position yourself where you can actually start to open up more time, whether that be, you know, doing it in the same city or, you know, figuring out how you can maybe get a different full time job that will help support those hours or like slowly start to back yourself out of the full-time position to get you into PMU full-time. Because if you're not giving yourself the opportunity or the availability for your clients, you're never going to know, right? Because if your client's like, oh, I can't get in with her until mid-December. Well, like that, I want to get mine done before Christmas. Well, I'm going to go to this person down the street, right? So you might be losing clients because of that. So it's really up to you, like, like how you want to configure your life to say, okay, this is the route I actually want to go. And this is going to be my full-time thing eventually, but I'm going to position myself today to make sure that I can slowly back myself out of it. Okay. Yeah. I hope that inspires you a little bit to yeah. think about that. Okay, good. It does. No, that's okay. great. Thank you. Awesome. Good. <laughs> All right. So Chandra is uh, Chandra's also in near Edmonton. She's in Spruce Grove. So she's asking, uh, what's your best way of marketing right now? Oh, that is a great question because it kind of changes yearly, actually. So when I first started my business, best marketing was word of mouth. So I actually start when I first started off, I did a bunch of free services, like everyone that I could get in, maybe 10 people, I kind of limited myself and said, I have to choose 10 people who are really going to talk highly about me, love this service. And those 10 people are going to tell, if they even tell one person, that's 10 other people that mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know what I mean? So Word of mouth when you're first starting out, like if you guys honestly just take out your phones right now, go through your contact list and ask every single person in your phone, hey, do you know anyone who needs PMU services? Not asking them if they need PMU services, but do you know anyone who needs them? You might be surprised who starts to refer you and who starts to like pass on your name and like, oh yeah, she does PMU now. So you're putting that in the heads of people and you're now pushing yourself out in a way that isn't pushy. So that word of mouth is number one. Um, now, when it comes to social media and different platforms, 
Instagram's a huge one because it's very photo based and like results based. So that's a very good platform to start building your clientele on. Um, I think there's really cheap advertising on Instagram right now. Facebook's a really great uh, resource. It all depends on your demographic and what you're looking for because that's going to really target your marketing. So when you get clear about who you want to market to, how you want to market, that's when the, everything's going to become clear on where you need to market. Mm -hmm. So I've gotten to a point where I started off with word of mouth, then moved to like Instagram, Facebook, a little bit of Pinterest here and there, and then eventually moving into YouTube and those different platforms because it's more educational. Um, people want to sit and binge watch and learn things and like see how things are done. So once you get to a point where you're stable and you can start creating more content around that, you'll slowly start to build in different platforms. And I think you should be on all of them, but the most important one is creating an email list. And I'm sure Marisol has talked to you about this because if Facebook goes away, if Instagram goes away, you don't own that. So you don't know who's on there. If you have 6,000 people, they could be gone tomorrow, but you own your email list. So make sure that you start creating and compiling an email, email list as soon as you possibly can. Yeah, exactly. So Chandra actually has a nice, uh, a hefty, uh, a hefty uh, email list that she's, uh, she's just been sitting on it, but she's going to start, you know, taking and sending out campaigns and everything. So. Get it moving girl. <laughs> yeah. All right, do we have any other further questions? We have Hetty and Danielle who haven't opened up their mics. Any other questions, girls? Danielle. Hi. Hi. Hello, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. My daughter has a fever, so that's why I haven't been saying much. I got her to sit down for a few minutes. I know. <laughs> um, how, um, so since we're on the subject of marketing, do you post to each um, like social media or email, like which do you rotate them out? Because I struggle with being consistent. Because yeah. honestly, I just don't like <laughs> doing social media posts because when you said that about hiring somebody to do that I was like that is so smart I never thought of that <laughs> I really don't like it <laughs> totally and that's that's okay because now you know who you are and what you want to be putting out there and how to put mm -hmm. it out there so when it comes to social media yeah you got to be consistent with it but each platform requires you to do different things so right. Um, for instance, what does really well on Facebook might not do well on Instagram and vice versa. So um, that's where, you know, we can get really in depth into this whole marketing thing and trying different things. That's called like A-B testing. So you can try a video and a photo and then you can go on and look at your analytics and see what does better. And then you can see what your audience specifically resonates with because every audience is going to be different. And then you can start creating content around what is really sticking. So if you have Instagram or if you have Facebook, go back on the posts that do really well for you. See what you think is intriguing to your audience about it. And then you can start creating content around that. Okay. And what about Google ads? Do you use those? Okay. Yeah. Optimizing is really important. Like on your website, having your SEO done properly but if you are doing all of your platforms correctly and you're putting valuable content out for your clients like value is when I go and I learn something from you so when you post um, a before and after are you talking about what's done why it was done what you use that's what people really want to know and so when you provide value to those people they'll show up again because they want to learn more from you so right. when you are optimizing on Google ads or your uh, website or any of the, things, the more keywords that you use that are all in sync, the more, and the more people are clicking on it, Google AdWords will start to recognize those like keywords. And that's when it starts to push you up in like the search engine. So they all okay. work together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, Thank you, Danielle, for that question. So something that uh, what actually caught my attention from you, uh, Giovanna, in the beginning was your, your feed. The Browse by G feed was so aspirational, so beautiful, so um, just so perfect. And you know, taking advantage of the fact that Instagram is such a 
uh, immediately visual platform in this form of a grid. You know, you can see nine different squares uh, straight off the bat. And it kind of gives you an, like, an all-encompassing image of what this place is like in just those nine squares, right? Um, and they were all very cohesive, like they all worked with one another, very whitish, minimalist, uh, kind of like the background that you have right now, you know, yeah. <laughs> nice and tidy. And it was just, it really appealed to me as, and, and, I, and I assumed also to my own demographic, women, you know, around this age and all that. Um, and I realized, like I started looking through it and I was like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. Like, how do I... What, what makes it so beautiful? And so I started going through your pictures and I, I realized you had um, like models come in and you were doing, I, I understood that you were hiring a marketing agency to come in and uh, take pictures and everything for your, for the business. So that was an initial investment as well, right? On your part. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to investing in your business, like that's, a major part for me is like the aesthetic and because I'm like one of the core things that I wanted to get across to my clientele was a luxury service like I need to post luxury photos right like to get that feel that clean white like high-end like that was the aesthetic I was going for so when I bring in models like I wanted to bring in um, like you don't need to pay a lot when you're first starting like that first set that I did like if you look back over two years ago like I hired a photographer to come in and take like really editorial shots of models um, which did really well at the time but now if I were to post those photos they wouldn't do really well because people want to see more in the moment and like realistic and what they're gonna expect right like not just this unattainable thing so uh, I've really changed kind of throughout the process with the ebb and flow of what people were um, I guess resonating with at the time so that's really important to keep an eye on it because if you don't then you're just gonna keep creating the same content that might look pretty but is not hitting with your customers right so there's a way that you can create pretty but still give value and give you know edu like give them uh, information at the same time Awesome. Yeah. But yeah, hiring a marketing person, um, that came this, uh, last year I hired a full-time marketing person. So she is my brand manager, which means she keeps the brand consistent. And so, um, if you do hire somebody, you want to make sure that they have that understanding of how to pick your brand colors, pick your fonts, pick your color scheme, and ensure that your full brand is consistent. And now that, you know, it, now that's a bit more attainable, you, we have Canva and you can just yes. be very, very conscientious of keeping it consistent. Um, you don't necessarily need it if you don't have it at this point, but it, it is still attainable. Um, yes. I wanted to say, so uh, I wanted to bring attention to what you just said, you know, that was last year that you brought on a, mark, a branding manager or marketing um, a marketing manager you've been in business for about six years and that and that just happened a year ago so yeah. with that I just want to touch on the patience right um, mm -hmm. of building up a business it, it, we all want immediate results we all do like we all want to have a million dollar company by <laughs> tomorrow right yeah. Um, yeah. it's taken you six years six years yeah and and of a lot of work and near exhaustion you've had to take serious breaks from um you know not not burning yourself out um, yeah. so just wanted to touch on that because it's um it's important to remember that Rome is not built in a day and it really takes time totally it's it's definitely a long game in this in this industry it's not something that is going to happen overnight and uh you're always going to be constantly changing and evolving and the industry it basically is like that as well. Like the PMU industry that I knew when I first started is completely different to the PMU industry I know today. So just be patient with that. Um, I had a few questions on the side here. How long did it take you to fill up your schedule once you committed to building your PMU business full time? How long did it take you before you were ready to open up a commercial space? Great question. So my first year, um, I rented like a small room. Uh, out of like a small um, aesthetics place. 
And I started there and until, and I started taking clients in between my classes uh, while I was still in business school. And I got to a place where I was so booked and like people like had a wait list going of people that I was like, okay, I need to like do this full time. So as soon as you feel like you're busting at the seams, it means like you're coming out of your shell and you need to like grow into the next phase. So the thing is like when you feel it, you'll know when your numbers are coming in, your clients are coming in and you're busting at the seams, it means that it's time to move up. Um, and basically I would say it took me about a year to really feel confident to step out and do my PMU business full time, where at that time I had to decide between finishing college and stepping out and doing it and college is always going to be there but the opportunity to start a business wasn't wasn't so I decided to go for it and then how long did it take of being consistent before seeing success in your business um well something that I really found was right off the bat because I was pushing really hard right out of the gate um, I knew I had to be consistent every single time, give every single person, like, I don't know, the, I would say like every single person who walks in my door has to be treated like a celebrity. Like, like if An Angelina Jolie walked in my door, how would I treat her? That's how I would treat every single person. So for me, that consistency was like something that came very easily to me. And, um, yeah, the success kind of started right from the beginning because I was the first one to offer it. So people, it kind of blew up like wildfire for me. And so that's where now for you guys, because the industry is a little bit more established, you can break in. You just need to work on building that client list and, and you know, having patience with it because like Marcel said, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Is it too late to find success in the industry? Sorry? Is it too late to find success in this industry? No way. No, no, no. Absolutely not. Because I will tell you, uh, long term PMU can be very stressful on people. And I've seen people leave the industry, leave their client list because they can't do it anymore. They weren't passionate about it to begin with because all they saw was the, you know, the potential to make money instead of like having the correct mindset towards the, the industry. If you go in thinking, oh, I just need to do this because I'm gonna make a ton of money, I promise you, you're not gonna get anywhere because people and clients feel that. If you go in with the true um, direction and intention that you wanna help people and that you're there to serve them and make them feel confident and every single person is the most important person in the room for you, that's when things will start to go. But if you're just like, oh, this person's a dollar sign, it's bad news, it's very bad news. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, one last question. So for me, one last yeah. question. Uh, when did you feel that you had finally reached a point where you were successful? Because I feel like that concept can be so elusive sometimes, especially I don't when feel successful. Right. <laughs> and you're getting all these clients. Oh, man small goals for yourself so like okay when i'm yeah. booked out a month in advance then then i'll know that i'm being successful so okay yeah. you get there and then you're like well no now i want to be three months booked out in advance and so does it does there ever a tipping point when you feel like okay i can yeah. say i'm successful you will always be chasing that forever because i to be honest like life is a journey it's not a destination and if you keep um, putting like this high expectation that getting to one thing is going to be the end all be all. You're going to be very disappointed. So honestly, if you just need to enjoy the process, you need to enjoy every single moment that you spend with your clients. You need to enjoy getting to be creative. You get to enjoy making somebody feel confident and making like a small, you know, mark in their life that can be so profound and so impactful. You have to love every single moment that you're in because that's when you just love what you do and like everything starts to flourish. But the second you have to be successful, you'll never be successful. You know, like it's all about what you feel about yourself and knowing that you're doing it for you and for the right reasons. That's all that matters. So as long as you're having fun doing it, as long as you are putting your heart and soul into it, as long as you are loving every single moment, that's success. You know, it doesn't mean like, you know, <laughs> it's not a number. It's not, you know, how many clients you have. It's, do you love what you get to do every day? Are you grateful that 
you get to go in and be creative and get to be your own boss every day. Like that's the most important thing. So uh, thank you for that. Chandra has a few other questions here. Yeah. Can you ask them? Yeah, so today, uh, do you find the economy directly affects your business? Um, see, that's hard because I live in Winnipeg and we have a pretty consistent economy. Whereas I know that some friends who also have PME businesses in Calgary were slightly affected by the economy. So yes, it can absolutely affect you, but you kind of have to work within that. So if you know that, you know, people don't have a lot of disposable income or they're uh, really suffering in terms of finances, you have to understand it's not everybody. And if you limit yourself into believing it's the economy and, and not, you know, what you're offering, then sometimes that can limit yourself. So I would just be careful with, um, those limiting beliefs and really doing your homework in terms of, you know, who you're trying to attract, what type of clientele, because that will really set your pricing and uh, help to build your business that way. And the other question is, you still experience slower months or is it consistently booked out? Um, yeah, I think with every business, because now I have 25 employees and like I have people who are just starting out and people who are, you know, um, they're experts and they've been in the industry with me now for six years. Um, th those people are booked up because they've built their client list. They really know how to connect with their clients and um, give really great service. And for people who are new, I'm helping them grow their business. So, I mean, if you're just starting out and you're finding it difficult, like, honestly, I'd say the best thing to do sometimes is like, you can still be your own boss, but work under somebody who has an established client list who is busting at the seams where you can build out your client list. And then maybe if you get to a point where you feel confident going out on your own or you have a different um, trajectory for yourself or you have a different vision for the way you want the business to go, then great. But I have a lot of employees who work with me and we get more done together than we do going out on our own. Mm -hmm. So it's really great because you can still learn to market yourself, build your client list, you know, work as a team. So it's totally up to you what resonates with you. Yeah, and that's actually, um, if we can touch on that briefly, um, mm. that's kind of how you run your business. You know, you, uh, yeah. you explained it to me, you have these two locations, but yeah. everyone is kind of like their own independent artist. And so you're yeah. there sort of supporting them, being a unifying marketing uh, channel. So yeah. you're there sort of as a as creative director to the whole hive and then everyone else is individual. And they all yes. get their own commissions, correct? Correct, correct. So um, because they're um, employees as well, they also get an hourly wage and they also get commission. Like for me, it's really important to know that even if they don't have a client booked or they come in and somebody cancels, like they're still getting paid. Like that's the difference is like I create a very secure environment for the artists where the risk is really taken off of them and now put onto me. But that also means that I take on a lot of responsibility when it comes to the marketing and dealing with the clients and ensuring that their schedules are booked. So all they need to do is come in, do the best job that they can possibly do, and then they get to go home and not have to think about their clients or think about work. They can shut off. Whereas like all our team on the side, like we have coordinators who book in appointments, deal with client complaints, all of that stuff. So if you're somebody who like gets really stressed out at everything going on around you, you know, having somebody to help you build those other aspects of your business can be rewarding. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, um, Chandra, I was piggybacking on that. So yeah. would you recommend bringing in new artists doing a commission split or hourly wage? So that for me depends on how new the client or how new the artist is. And if, you know, I train all of my artists. So when they're first starting out, they don't make a commission because they're building up their client list and they're basically getting paid an hourly wage to learn the service and, you know, build up their skill set. But as they start to build their own client list, then we do an hourly wage and a commission split. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, what do you think about running specials? Like does Brow by, Browse by G discount offers or do you prefer kind of like package deals which is your what's your opinion on that which is better well to be honest with you browse by g like we don't like to discount our services because that's just not the brand that we are but we will do specials here and there like for black friday or um you know 
certain holidays we'll do like a yearly thing. Um, we do packages because we also have a brow bar, which is like shaping, tinting henna. So, um, and then with microblading, it's like including the touch up, maybe the touch up and the aftercare balm or something like that, where, you know, we're not discounting our service, but we're making the client also feel like they're getting value for buying a package. Right. Or if the friend, if they bring in a friend, like they might get $50 off their, their appointment or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, that's awesome, Giovanna. Thank you so Thank much. You. Does anyone sure. have any last few questions? I know we're going over. Um, that's great. Awesome. I, you know, I'd ask you like a gazillion more questions. <laughs> yeah. Anytime you guys can feel free to send me a DM on Instagram or, you know, message me. I'm always, an, I'm an open book when it comes to this. I really want to support artists in this industry. If you want to reach Giovanna, you can reach her at, uh, on Instagram or her own account, Giovanna Menena. I'll set it here. Grass by G is, uh, is the corporate one. So if you want to reach her directly, she's broken out and gotten her own uh, Instagram that she's building up and it's amazing. If you want to draw a feed, do you, how do you keep, like, how do you get all these, uh, amazing shots? Is your husband an Instagram husband? No, actually, um, I have a, a lot of photographer friends and actually I, I coach one of the photographers who, um, helps me out as well. And, um, she does like influencer packages which I think is so smart as a photographer so like once a month you pay a certain rate and then you get your six shots for the month or ten shots whatever you agree on and then yeah that allows me to create content around that and have fresh fresh photos so yeah so I guess uh you know just to recap before before I let you go um hmm. I think what was the what was the single most important thing that you did in the course of these last five years that made the biggest difference for your business? What was that? Honestly, I think it was what you were saying about staying classy because businesses came and went because they were talking, they were so toxic, toxic environments and clients feel that. So you have to remain so professional. You have to have integrity. You have to ensure that you're honest with all of your employees and all of your, if you have employees or want employees and all of your clients, like honesty, vulnerability, being open, like all of these things that sometimes take a lot of courage to do. You got to show up every day with those things because it's going to set you apart from the people next to you who maybe have a negative mindset or don't believe in themselves or need to like tear down other people to make themselves feel better. So. Yeah, I think the other thing that really resonated for me was what you were saying about investing back into your business and not, yeah. not being afraid to do that. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, as an initial step, as I work with a lot of uh, artists who are just getting, getting started and building out their business, you know, they, um, they have already invested, when they get to me, they've already invested quite a bit of money in yes started you know and getting equipment and uh training and then uh the training for the training and then you know so a bunch of stuff and, and getting that location so up until that point they've already invested quite a bit of money but then they feel like well do i really need to keep investing money um and i think the answer is yes if you get to a point where you really want it to um, make a difference. You, you treat yourself as you would any other business. And any if anybody wants to open up a restaurant, they need to have at least fifty thousand dollars in the bank, uh, or at least as a as an investment, you know, from someone else, um, you know, just to put it out there so they can really really get started. Um, and when we spoke uh, on the phone before the actual phone call, I think that's what you know you said was absolutely key and I just really want to emphasize that because I feel like that um, makes the biggest difference right you know and you touched on everything Google Ads, social mm -hmm. media, uh, <laughs> Facebook so uh, basically everything right and hey I'll be completely honest like if you find debt to be intimidating I will challenge you to look at debt in a very different way as in you are leveraging your debt to learn more to invest in yourself and 
pull you out forward long term. Um, on my website, I have a blog post about, you know, debt is scary or is it? So make sure to check that out. And like you said, Marcel, like investing in yourself, what like to this day, I've probably invested over like $250,000 just in myself, in my business. Like I leverage probably anywhere between $50,000 to $100,000 of debt, you know, for like all the stuff that we have to purchase and like further training for my artists, because all of this I know is going to put us ahead of the game. And unless you're willing to really like show up and invest and learn, you're not going to get any further because you're just going to stay at the same spot. You're not doing anything different to get yourself inspired or learn new skill sets or understand different, you know, parts of the industry. So absolutely agree with you that investing in yourself is number one. Taking a risk. Thank you, mm -hmm. Donna. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we definitely got a lot of value out of your visit. Thank you so much. Um, this interview is going to go up on YouTube. So uh, you can also, I'll give you the link when it's ready. And awesome. uh, everyone else, you can, uh, you know, Giovanna just wrote down her information, her contact information here on the chat. So you're welcome to reach out to her and go follow her on her socials. Thank you so much, Giovanna. Thank you. Thank, uh, you. thank you. I know. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs>